Well, welcome aboard, everybody. Glad you could meet with us today. My name is Mike Rogi. I am uh, work for University of Illinois Extension as a local food small farms educator in Quincy, Illinois. And uh, we're talking today about sweet corn production, so we're glad you could be with us. Uh, sweet corn, uh, just a brief history here. Uh, sweet corn has been around for who knows how long. Uh, you know, the Indians and uh, I think corn originated in in Mexico and Central America, and uh, sweet corn is simply a mutation of some of that earlier corn that had a little sweeter taste. The first recorded uh, use of sweet corn was in 1779, um, so been around for a long time anyway. Uh, open, po open pollinated white sweet corn was popular in the 1800s. As you can see, 1933, the first single cross hybrid was developed, and then in 1953, there's a professor at the U of I who, uh, through some research and some uh, uh, research trials, published some research on uh, super sweet sweet corns. Uh, Illinois Foundation Seed sold that under the name of Illini Extra Sweet that many of you have probably had at some point in time. So it's a very popular super sweet uh, variety of sweet corn. So what separates sweet corn from field corn? Uh, you know, there's a number of different types of corn. We have uh, popcorn, flint corn, field corn, a waxy corn, there's a number of different corns. But uh, the sweet corn mutation that was found, you know, how many years ago, essentially was a gene that manipulated higher sugar content in that kernel of corn. That That's the basic difference right there between field corn and sweet corn is it contains a little bit higher amount of sugar. And we'll get in, as, as we get into the program, we'll talk about the different types of sweet corn and how they differ in sugar concentrations. One of the things that allows sweet corn to, to remain sweeter for longer is that some of the varieties of sweet corn have found a way to uh, prohibit the sugars or to reduce the no, a number of sugars that are converting to starches in the endosperm. Uh, starches and sugars are both carbohydrates. Sugars will eventually turn to, carb to uh, starch. So the sweet corns that stay the sweetest longest uh, the genes been manipulated to be able to allow that sugar to stay longer inside that endosperm before it does change to starch. And of course, uh, we all know that if you allow sweet corn to mature, you'll get nice, crunchy, hard kernels like field corn. So obviously, sweet corn needs to be consumed before the kernels need to be consumed before they reach maturity. Okay, some different types of sweet corn. As you peruse the catalogs for sweet corn varieties. I mean, there'll be some catalogs you'll receive that have 10, 12, 15 pages of different sweet corns in them. There's a huge selection of sweet corns available for the market. So we'll break them down into different types of sweet corn. The normal sugary ones are the ones that have been around forever. Those are the original sweet corns. We call them SUs, sugar, normal sugar. And, and they were good in their time. Uh, I don't think there's very, there are very few people who still grow that variety, however, or that type. There may be some open pollinator, some heirloom varieties that fall into that category. But, you know, the problem is it's just not as sweet as the other corns on the market. The other problem is it has to be eaten immediately after it's picked. Even leaving it a day in the refrigerator, you'll get a, large, a lot of con conversion from those sugars that go into starches. And sugars is, is what causes the sweetness in sweet corn. So the normal sugary hybrids, those types are just not found very often anymore in commercial sweet corn. Sugary enhanced, uh, those are very, somewhat popular uh, in the marketplace. You can see quite an increase in the amount of sugar in that endosperm as opposed to the normal sugary ones. Now there's, there's recessive and there's... Uh, uh, well, there, you can either get the recessive or the dominant SE, so you'll have one parent or both parents that go into that hybrid that express that SE trait, that sugar enhanced trait, and it can make a difference in the sweetness of that sugar enhanced hybrid. The shrunken uh, or super sweet as we call them, uh, SH2s, you, there's a noticeable crunch as you, as you eat those sweet corns because it has a much higher sugar content than either the sugary enhanced 
or the normal sugars. Uh, it, it's got a definite crunchy taste to it. Some people find that good, some people not so good. So marketing what might be important for you to determine how you want or what types of sweet corn you want to grow based upon what your marketplace wants. There's synergistic hybrids and those synergistic hybrids combine uh, the top the uh, three types that we mentioned prior the shrunken the SEs and the SUs and they have augmented which contain various mixtures both recessive and dominant traits of the SH2 SEs and SUs uh, many times those augmented are not going to be known as augmented in the catalog They'll have a name, you know, Rupps might have a name for them. Johnny's will have a name for them. The seed companies themselves kind of call those traits individually by the seed company. So just know that there's different mixtures of SH2, SEs, and SUs. The combination of those three genes will, will be the synergistic corns and the augmented corns. And, and all those corns that we mentioned are available as bicolor meaning yellow and white kernels on the same cob, or all yellow or all white. And again, your market is going to determine, the market preference your customers is going to determine which type of corn you grow, as well as the color of that corn. And does, does color really have a taste difference? I mean, is, is if you could get the same hybrid in white or yellow or by color, could you taste a difference? And the answer is no, not, not on your palate. But we all know that, uh, well, I guess we don't all know, but I, I think I've read someplace where your eyesight has a, is a, a very strong contributing factor to the taste of, of products. So we, we taste with our eyes as well as our tongue. So go with what your customer wants as far as, as, far as coloration. Uh, the sugary enhanced and also the SUs, the, the, the normal sugary ones, can either be heterozygous or homozygous. Uh, heterozygous meaning just one parent contributes to that gene, and whereas homozygous means both parents contribute that trait to that gene. Now the synergistics uh, are a combination of SH2 and SE and SU, as well as the augmented have the same concentration. But it, de it depends upon if it's a certain term synergistic or termed aug uh, augmented as to the percent of each of these three types that go into that cross. So it's not as, it, it sounds more complicated than what it actually is. Just know that we can get various levels of sugary with SEs and SUs based upon whether we have a homozygous or a heterozygous uh, hybrid, F1 hybrid. There's all kinds of ways to determine what variety of sweet corn you want. Um, and I've listed some of them here. It's probably most of them that I could think of. I'm sure there's probably a few that aren't included in here, but for the most part, this is a fairly comprehensive list of reasons to determine what variety of sweet corn you want to select and grow for your market. Cold soil tolerance uh, is one trait. Um, and sweet corns have an, a, a hugely a vastly different tolerance to cold soil. Uh, as you all know, if you've been to the market, the uh, earlier the sweet corn comes onto the market, the higher the premium. We've got growers over here that that plan uh, for some early market, and they're oftentimes one to two dollars a dozen higher than a normal price come the middle of July. When you not you know when most of the sweet corn is just starting to come onto the market in this locale about the middle of the the first two weeks of July, so those growers who can get sweet corn in the Quincy area, oh the last week of June for say June twentieth for instance are going to command a much higher price, and we'll talk about how to promote early corn here a little bit later. But having early corn oftentimes commands a higher price. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best tasting corn of the season because it won't be the best tasting corn. But if you haven't had sweet corn for nine months, fresh sweet corn for nine months, you can get by without having the 100% the taste by having it early. 
So there are growers, many growers do try to get some early sweet corn. So cold to soil tolerance is an important trait for many growers. Herbicide and insecticide resistance is another trait that's available to some corns. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Maturity, we, we touched on that briefly, but we'll see maturity ranges anywhere from oh, 70 days, maybe 68 to 65 being the earliest maturity as, as late as 82 to 85 day maturity. So we've got two weeks of maturity differences between hybrids of sweet corn. Ear height and ear attachment can make a difference if you're hand picking. Uh, it's not real fun to bend over all day long picking sweet corn that's, that's two foot above the ground, especially if it's a tight attachment of that husk or to the to the uh, ear shank. If that ear shank is tightly attached, it takes harder, it's much harder to break that off by hand. And in fact, uh, there are some commercial growers who use machine harvest who won't grow certain hybrids just because of that attachment of that ear shank is so strong. It makes it really difficult to get off by picking. So ear height can be one selection factor. Flavor, obviously, should be an important one. Ear size is also an important factor. Many of the early sweet corns are going to be much smaller or somewhat smaller in size as the more normal full season sweet corns. When you plant for early to capture that premium, you have to sacrifice many things. And one of those things you sacrifice is ear size. Sugar conversion. Um, we talked about the different types of sweet corn a couple slides ago, the normal sugaries, the sugar enhanced and the shrunkens. Well, there's a huge difference in how quickly those sugars convert to starch in those three types of sweet corn. Um, we, we talked about the normal sugaries. You have to eat them immediately. So you're not going to ship those or store those. Uh, those are immediate eat type of varieties of sweet corn. The SEs can be stored for maybe up to a week under ideal conditions, whereas the shrunkens or super sweets can be stored two, maybe three weeks under under optimal storage conditions. So if you're shipping or storing, you probably want to cons consider a shrunken type kernel. Kernel color uh, needs to be a deciding factor based upon your market. How they normally buy sweet corn is how you will probably want to grow sweet corn so they can uh, uh, buy some of yours. Disease resistance. Uh, there are several different diseases of importance to sweet corn growers especially in the later season. Uh, northern corn leaf blight might be one of those. Rust could be another one. And the different hybrids have different disease-resistant packages that are included with that hybrid. Now, I guess I should point out, too, that the second factor I listed, that the herbicide and insect resistance, is done through genetic modification. Every one of these other traits is done through conventional breeding. So it's not genetically modified. The herbicide and insect insecticide resistance is completed by genetic modification. None of these other traits are genetically altered through uh, manipulation of the genes. A lodging can be a concern. Um, sweet corn varieties have gotten much, they're much improved from where they were 10, 20 years ago as far as lodging resistance. Although there's still some, time, we always get a wind in July. You know, the thing you hate in, in, with winds in July and August when the sweet corn is ready to pick is lodging. Uh, some hybrids have a better ability to withstand high winds, and maybe not that high wind, 30, 40 mile an hour wind can do it as well. It's no fun picking lodged corn. Uh, so that may be an important trait depending upon how open your sweet corn patch is to, to the wind. Husk or tip tightness and, sh and shank strength. We talked about shank strength earlier, but husk tightness can make a difference too as far as uh, uh, bird injury, for instance, or ability of the worm to enter that husk. So that might be something to look at. And obviously the yield is an important characteristic. We're going to talk about culture of sweet corn now, uh, planting date, fertility, weeds, etc. So plant date and rate. Um, most growers I know, ourselves included, shoot for a 20 to 25,000 per acre plant population. And, you know, it depends on the soil type, how much uh, 
how how easy that sweet corn is to, to seed how it suckers for instance some plants sucker a lot so if you get too low populations you get increased suckering and the suckers don't yield any any ears they do contribute negatively towards picking ease though uh, so, you know, after you've been growing sweet corn a few years, you'll kind of figure out where your comfortable population level is. But it's definitely going to be less than field corn. But 20 to 25 is a place to start. And again, recall that some hybrids are better adapted to cold soils. And under cold soil conditions, you oftentimes plant a little heavier because we know some of that seed is not going to germinate successfully due to cold soil conditions. So. Early season plantings will probably go towards the 25,000 population, and then the third and fourth planting, the later season plantings will hover towards that 20,000, just knowing that we're going to see some mortality due to early planting and cool soil conditions. How do you plant? Well, there's all kinds of ways to plant corn from simple to complex. The middle picture there showing a hoe is about as simple as you can get. The picture to the left shows a, a vacuum planter, and that's probably the, one of the more complicated mechanisms to plant corn. As long as you get that sweet corn in the ground, the desired depth and the desired distance, it doesn't really matter to the sweet corn seed how it's planted. It's going to be your ease of getting that seed planted. The lower right-hand corner is an earthway seeder, and many small market gardeners will use something like that to help seed uh, individual sweet corn seed. We have plate planters, which show some, some seed plates in the upper right-hand corner. Those planters are pretty, uh, they're not very common anymore, but 20 years ago, they're they were more common. The uh, lower left shows a, a meter out of a John Deere 7000 finger pickup. Uh, you know, the Kinsey and the John Deere finger pickups are still commonly used by sweet corn growers. Can you talk about isolation? Uh, on some of these or on all these sweet corn types uh, because we don't want contamination of that pollen if we have a, a specific sweet corn if we have a shrunken a super sweet an sh2 sweet corn next to our neighbor's field corn or next to our se or su corn for instance we do not want pollen drifting from the field or the se or the su onto the shrunken kernel because it can negate that extra sugar content and leave more starch in the endosperm which really you're going to be growing field corn at that point in time so isolation between all sweet corns between SEs between SUs and between shrunkens have to take place just to avoid reducing the impact of that type trait so keep them all isolated uh, and again, you have to isolate, isolate SH2s from, from everything, even from the synergistics, simply because we don't want that pollen contaminating the SH2s. Now, we can achieve that isolation either by distance. You know, we talk about pollen flying so many feet. And I don't know if there's a, you know, I'm, I'm guessing 100 foot would be a good distance to make sure we don't get any hybrids closer together than 100 foot. Or we can isolate those sweet corn types by pollination date. So what I mean by that is if we don't if we have an SH2 right next to an SE and there's 10 or more days difference in maturity between those two hybrids, you're not going to get pollen flying from one to the other. So it's very easy to accomplish that by isolation. If you can't do it by distance, do it by pollen pollination date. Avoid putting an SH2 next to an SE if their maturity is within 10 days of one another, <clears throat> just reduce the potential of contamination of pollen. Succession planting. Um, as you all know, sweet corn is a one pick uh, vegetable. You know, you may get a second ear off of some of them, but it's not likely it's going to be a very marketable ear, especially if you have your population between 20 and 25,000. So it's a, it's a it's a one it's a one pick uh, vegetable. We want to we want to have sweet corn on our market more than more than one week though, don't we? So we have to look at succession planting. That can be accomplished through several different methods. Uh, 
the simplest method, although it's not very easy to do, is just to, if you want to plant the same hybrid that you really like, plant it every so many days. And I can't tell you how often that should be because it's going to depend upon how quickly that corn's growing. Um, but, you know, if you plant the same hybrid, when the first corn comes up, if it's up maybe an inch in height, perhaps you should plant the second planting then. Um, it usually takes about <clears throat> 100 growing degree days, maybe 120 growing degree days to get corn, after you plant it, to get corn emerged, to be germinated and emerged. Now, 120 growing degree days is going to be, it might be 10 days. The second, you know, if you plant that corn on the 10th of April, it may take 10 days to achieve 120 growing degree days. If you plant that same hybrid June 1st, you may get that in three or four days. Simply because the temperatures are much more warm in June, so the 120 growing degree days will accumulate more, much more rapidly. And that's why I can't tell you how often you should plant. It is going to depend upon how many growing degree days you, you're, uh, you're accumulating when you plant that corn. <clears throat> But, you know, to try to do that, you know, it's going to be hard to do because soil conditions probably are not going to work out in your favor every 10 days to plant this hybrid. We know that's not going to work. So what growers do is plant several different maturities at the same time, spraying out the length of picking for that individual planting. Uh, and I'll talk about that here, for instance, uh, the last paragraph here. On, on this slide here, we, if we had a planting that contains four different maturities of sweet corn with two to four different days maturity between each variety. So you have a you have a 72, you have a 75, you had a 78 and an 82 day hybrid. OK, so you've got. What, eight different eight days of maturity difference between those two, something like that, you plan the same date. You can have, you know, probably a week to two week, pick, well, a week picking on that planting, for instance. So when should you plant the next high, when should you plant the next planting after that? That's where we have to go back to our and do some math looking at growing degree days. And all we can do is estimate when our next planting should take place because when these hybrids that we planted the 10th of April, whenever it was, mature sometime the, you know, the 10th of July or whatever, Growing degree days are going to be much more, uh, we're going to accumulate many more growing degree days in July than we will in April. So we're, when we figure out when to plant the second planting after the 10th of April, should we wait, you know, two weeks? Should we wait 10 days? Should we wait 15 days or 18 days? What I often do is look at the calendar and try to go by averages and figure growing degree days in the middle of July. How many growing degree days am I going to get the middle of July? Say I'm going to get 20, 25 growing degree days in the middle of July. I'll go back and determine, okay, how long, how many days in April is it going to take me to accumulate 25 growing degree days? Well, it's probably going to take three, maybe four days. So I'm utilizing estimated growing degree days in July to determine when the planting after my first planting should take place, you know, the 1st of May or the end of April. And again, it's, it's, it's not an exact science. It's a lot of guesswork involved with it. But you can get fairly close to it. So that would be my suggestion on trying to make sure that once you start picking sweet corn the 1st of July, or whenever you start picking sweet corn, you're going to have a hybrid to pick for the, you know, until you quit your season whenever you want to quit it. Because once you start having sweet corn, you probably don't want to not have it because your customers are more than likely going to expect it when they come and buy buy your product from you so succession planting it's easier said than done it's not an exact science but we can come pretty close by looking at growing degree day accumulations and then converting those from july back into april and may planting time so i hope i didn't confuse anybody doing that it, it's um, i hope you understand what i'll talk what i'm trying to explain here but again how we determine when our second third fourth fifth planting should take place is determining Growing degree days at picking time, converting more to growing degree days to when I want to plant in April and May, and then making a decision based upon when my last maturity is going to mature from that planting date. So, hey Mike, Mike, just just to make sure we're all on the same page, just give us a 
a 60 second uh, explanation once again of, of the difference between just a day and a growing degree day and what you're talking about so we're all on the same page. Okay, I'm sorry Kylie, thanks for bringing that up. A growing degree day for, for corn is at 50 degrees. If we have a high, let me get my pen, if we have a high of, of 85 and a low of 60, we add those two days together, we have what, 145 divided by 2 Okay, you follow me now. We have a high of 85, a low of 60. Total accumulation of, of, of degree days that day is 145. Divide that by two to come up with an average. We get uh, 72.5 or 72.25. We take away a base of 50 because sweet corn grows. Sweet corn will grow with temperatures above 50 degrees. So we use 50 degrees as our base temperature. So our average. 80, high 85, low of 60, 145 degree days total. Divide that by two, so we get an average of 72 degree days that day. So track 50, which is the base temperature that corn grows, we end up with 22 degree days that day. Does that make sense? That that one day, uh, the question I see, so here that one day in May give us 22 growing degree days. Um, the day I'm referring to, we had a high of 85 and a low of 60, so it's probably going to be the middle of July. 85 for high, 60 for a low, 145 degrees total. Divide that by two to come up with an average of 72 growing degree days. So track 50, which is the temperature that corn begins growing on. So 50 is the base temperature for corn, leaves us 22 growing degree days in the middle of July. <clears throat> okay, for fertility then. Uh, we recommend a soil test every three or four years because uh, we need to make sure our, 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 our nutrient capacity of the soil is, is, uh, is high enough that corn can yield well. A pH, we like to see anywhere from 6.2 to 6.5, so it's going to be slightly acid. Sweet corn requires 80 to 100 pounds of per acre of nitrogen. Uh, if you have a heavy black soil, high organic matter, it's probably going to take closer to the 80 pounds. If your soil is more sandy or a low organic matter soil, a timber soil, it's going to take closer to 100. So base the amount of nitrogen on your on your organic matter, your soil. We want to maintain a soil phos phosphorus test of 40 pounds per acre or more. And a soil potassium test of uh, 300 pounds or greater. And phosphorus and potassium are added yearly or every other year based upon your soil fertility test. But nitrogen is applied every year. If you're a, a more of a small scale grower, the uh, about well, 20 pounds of a 12-12-12 will get you 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So if you're looking at you know a large garden 20 pounds of a 12, 12, 12, per, or similar, a 10, 10, 10, for 1,000 square foot will give you that 100 pounds of nitrogen. But remember, you know, because we need pollination uh, to ensure we get kernel set, we always recommend a minimum of two rows wide in the garden, just so we got good pollination that occurs in that garden. Okay, early enough, we talked about many growers try to be the first on the market. Uh, and there's different ways to do that. Now, I don't know any grower myself who's using all these, but this is what's being done uh, across the United States and across the Midwest to promote earliness. Now, of course, you're all going to try to plant an early maturing variety or hybrid in your first time slot. And that's probably the only time you're going to grow a 70-day hybrid is in your first time slot because that 70-day hybrid, for the most part, probably has excellent cold soil tolerance. But the ears aren't going to be nearly as good, and it probably won't be quite as tasty. As a general rule, not, not all the time, as a general rule. But for earliness, you want that corn to come on as soon as you can, so you can so you can uh, take advantage of the price increase. So look on the early hybrids. Everybody does that for the first planting, and they're probably not going to plant that 70-day 70 70 hybrid any other time in the, except the first time slot. There are growers in, in Wisconsin, I know, that transplant sweet corn, believe it or not, trying to get that July 4th market in Wisconsin. 
Uh, now we say we're in Quincy, Illinois, which is uh, extreme western Illinois, where where Missouri, Iowa, and Illinois all come together. That's where Quincy's at. And you know we have to be on our toes to get and, and have good weather to get a July Fourth uh, crop harvested. And so you can imagine Wisconsin, how difficult it is to get a July 4th crop picked. So transplanting is one method that growers up there will utilize to get a jump on, har on, on early harvest. There are growers who use clear row cover uh, or clear plastic. I, I shouldn't say row cover, clear plastic. There's machines out there that will plant sweet corn and install a row cover or excuse me, install, install a low tunnel, a plastic low tunnel with slits in it. That's not uncommon in Wisconsin. You could also use a, a black plastic on a raised bed. We do know that raised beds, uh, because they are exposed to the sunlight, dry out quicker, but they also warm up quicker. And putting black plastic on a raised bed will increase that warmth, uh, that, that warmth quicker than just open air. The thing we have to have is that black plastic coming to very close contact with the soil surface so that if there's an air if there's an air gap between the black plastic and the soil surface that's an insulation that that inhibits soil from warming up if we have a very close contact of the black plastic to the soil that allows that heat that's being uh, uh, radiated by the black plastic to transfer into the soil so make sure it's a tight fit if you're going to do that sandy soil the growers over here that have the corn by July 4th, always plant on sandy soil. Sandy soil warms up quicker than high organic matter soil does. It also is much drier earlier part of the season, so they can get good stands established with, on warmer soils than we can on the high organic matter soils. We talked about higher hybrid maturity, and some growers use a combination of the above just to get that early season crop off to a good start. Weed control, I'm not going to say a whole lot. Matter of fact, this is the only slide I have for weed control. Um, everybody I know who's a commercial grower is using an atrazine acetochlor mix. Uh, there are a number of them out there in the marketplace. There's, some, there's a number of generic out there in the marketplace. So, you know, we're not going to uh, mention any trade names here, but there's a number of them available. Uh, the bottom website I have outlined there is the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for commercial growers. It lists all the herbicides available to sweet corn growers that there are. So, you know, we would recommend an atrazine acetochlor combination as a standard weed control. Post-emerge, there's several products available as well. Um, most growers that I know don't utilize a lot of post-emerge herbicides. You'll notice Liberty and Roundup are highlighted there, have an asterisk by them. The uh, genetically modified corn hybrids, sweet corn hybrids we have uh, are, are resistant to either Roundup or Liberty. Not both, but either Roundup or Liberty. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But Roundup, you all know, is a non-selective herbicide that controls just about any wheat that's not resistant to it. And Liberty is another non-selective herbicide. Uh, note though that Roundup is systemic. It translocates down to the root, so it'll work on perennial weeds. Versus Liberty uh, is not systemic. It's a contact herbicide, so it has to be whatever the spray comes in contact will be controlled as long as it's a smaller weed. But again, all the references that we control should probably go to this website right here and uh, you'll get the full gamut of products available for sweet corn growers as well as use rates and what weeds they will work on. For organic growers, uh, you know, what sort of weed control options are available to organic growers? Well, you know, corn is a good, healthy, strong, uh, vigorously growing crop. And as you organic growers know, a good, healthy, vigorous crop does a lot for weed control simply by competition. So there'll be some weed control due to competition, but it's not going to provide 100% control. Mulching is, is commonly used. Uh, you all know what the Santa Claus method is, I think. Uh, ho, ho, ho. You know, that's the Santa Claus method of weed control. We all use it. You'll see a picture of the guy here on the right-hand side with a flamer. Uh, 
flaming is done on commercial organic farms and, and sweet corn as field corn is makes a great crop to flame especially if you get some size difference to that corn you get a corn stalk maybe eight ten inches height at minimum and you got some weeds that are one or two inches or less in height uh, it sweet corn makes an excellent crop to flame because of that height difference and because you have multiple leaves on the outside of that corn plant that's kind of protecting the growing point of that corn plant from that flame. Plus, I guess, if you want to heat your hot dog up for lunch, there you, you, you're ready to go with the flamer. Uh, commercial field crop producers and sweet corn producers that are organic will often use cultivation, rotary, uh, probably two rotary hoes is the optimal before crop emergence. And then one or two cultivations during the growing season to help clean up any weeds. So there's opportunities available for organic weed control in sweet corn. Insect control. Uh, really one main insect, that's a corn earworm. That's a challenge every year. European corn borer may or may not be a problem. A lot of it depends upon where you're located at geographically in a state simply due to the number of BT corn hybrids that commercial corn growers are growing. Uh, black cutworm and fall armyworm may not be a, may be a problem. Black cutworm can be a problem, especially if you're no-tilling or you have a, a lot of residue in early planting. Um, we don't worry about it in second, third, or fourth plants, but first planting it could be an issue. Fall armyworm is going to be more of a problem in the later planted corns. I'm not going to, I don't really have any slides to discuss cutworm or, or fall armyworm. They're modern, they're, they're moderate problems if, if they're problems at all. But there are growers here who, with late sweet corn, to get fall armyworm, well, maybe three or four years out of five. So it's not uncommon to get that. But there are treatments for it, and, and basically it's the same treatments that we use for corn earworm. Uh, European corn borer. Again, it can be a problem, to, and a lot of it depends upon the state where we're at in the state you reside. Um, if you're in, in western Illinois, you're going to have corn borer. We have, oh, probably 25, maybe 30 percent of all the corn acres here, field corn acres, that are non-GMO corns. So because we have such a high number of non-GMO corn acres, we have a fairly good-sized European corn borer population. Other parts of the state, you're probably looking at 80 or 90 percent or more of the acre of the field corn acres that's grown with genetically modified hybrids. Because those genetically modified hybrids for corn borer have been around since well, 96 or 97, I believe, uh, we've seen a crash of corn borer populations in many parts of Illinois. Uh, we still get corn borer over here. Uh, we had a severe corn borer population in our field corn this year. Uh, I had corn borer in our first you know, first and second planted sweet corn this year. We had to control. And we'll get corn borer maybe one or two years out of five over here. So it's something we have to scout for. Uh, treatment is fairly simple. We use a pyrethroid uh, to control it. The same products we use for earworm will control European corn borer. Uh, and, and if we do have populations of European corn borer come in on our Sec, you know, in our later plantings, uh, again, we scout for those uh, and, and take necessary action if, if we need to. For organic growers, uh, BT, uh, Dipel is one. BT will work. Uh, and, and Trust is another product organically that will provide control as well. Uh, and again, your BT hybrids, uh, the ones we talked about earlier that have the, the herbicide resistance, they're also uh, have uh, traits in them, protein traits that, that are allow for corn borer control as well. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Can you just spend 30, 40 seconds here and talk about timing with those and how that, um, you know, when when they're going to need, when they can spray it so it will work and when they can't just generally? You see the picture here in our lower right-hand corner. It's a corn plant. It's field corn, but it shows feeding by by first and second instar European corn borers. Uh, the important thing like Kyle was mentioning here, we have to treat corn borers before they enter the plant. They're called corn borers for a reason, right? But the first two instars, when they're very young, 
they'll feed on the external part of the plant. And what we're seeing here is external leaf scarring of first and second instars on, on corn. When we see when we see levels like that, when we see the scarring on the external leaf tissue, that lets us know that we're seeing European corn borer at first and second instars. So that's the time to scout your, your corn fields. Go on to the sweet corn patch, count off 25, 25 plants. And what percent of those have this etching on them? Do that in probably four different parts of the field. So you've got 100 plants. How many of those 100 plants did you see this etching of the leaf on? If it was more than 10 or 15 of those plants had etching on, you probably want to control corn borer. You have to do it before they go to the third instar. So when you see this, this uh, etching, that's when you need to take action. As Kyle referenced earlier, you have to be aware of the life cycle of the corn borer in order to control it. Once it gets to the third instar, it'll tunnel into the mid rib of the plant and then tunnel into the internal portion of the plant. It's you know, unable to control it. You gotta control it when it's young and when you see this leaf scarring. Uh, corn earworm is the menace we all worry about, you know, regardless of where you're at in the Midwest. So I'm going to ask you the, the joke here that's, as a sweet corn grower, you probably already know this, but I, what is worse than finding a worm in your ear of corn? Well, finding half a worm in your ear of corn, right? We, we call it the high protein corn for, for reasons unknown to me. Corn earworm, uh, Moths overwinter in the southern United States. They don't overwinter here in our in the Midwest because of the cold weather. Although uh, I think many entomologists feel there's a population of corn earworm that does overwinter in the St. Louis Collins, Collinsville area, actually, because of the large amount of sweet corn grow in that area. Um, but otherwise, we're dependent upon southern states. Well, not dependent upon, but those moths migrate from the southern states into the into the to the Midwest. We need to begin monitoring for those corn earworm at first tassel. And we use heliothis traps in a pheromone. I'll show you a picture of those here pretty soon. And just remember, as we're monitoring for these this population, we do that so we know when to spray. And if I have a night, and I'll go out and check my, my trap every day during sweet corn season to see how many moths I captured. My mo I can guarantee you my moth capture is going to be very different than a guy who's growing sweet corn just a county away because these earworms fly into the, into the Midwest on storm fronts. And they're deposited where, that's, where it starts raining or, the, or that, that uh, higher, that low, that storm front weakens. So the populations are very erratic across the, across the Midwest. So you cannot use somebody else's trap data to determine when you should make applications to control earworm. So just remember, really want to do a good job on earworm management and keep worms out of your corn through a spray. You need to be monitoring populations on your own farm and your own locale. And here's a, a couple of earworm traps here. The one on the lower right is a nylon trap. Um, they're fairly inexpensive, but but we would recommend, hardly recommend, the the uh, the aluminum trap you see on the left-hand side of your screen there. The aluminum trap has been found through research to be much more reliable in determining populations. The nylon trap will work, the lower right-hand corner will work, but in under low population scenarios, it doesn't record as accurately or give you the kind of data you really need to plan an effective corn earworm management strategy. So this trap here on the on the left hand side, we set it into a post into the ground. We try to have the bottom of that trap equal to the height of the of the silk on the ear. We'll use a pheromone, which is a female scent, to capture male corn earworm moths. They'll fly into the bottom part of that trap. They'll work they'll fly around to that larger part of the trap, always working their way up, and eventually they'll end up in that in that top of that trap because there's an opening at the very top of that larger cone that empties into that smaller portion of the trap on top of it. Every morning I'll capture and count the number of earworm moths I have in there and use that to determine how often I should spray for a corn earworm. Pyrethroids are the common 
pest control product to use. Uh, to, to use the pyrethroid, you have to have a restricted use license. Uh, you can get those, you know, contact your local extension office. Now's the time to be giving that license so, so you can buy pyrethroids. The corn earworm moth, the female lays eggs on silks. That's, that egg will hatch depending on the temperatures, the warmer the temperature. If it's, if it's 90 degrees during the day, those eggs will hatch in two to three days. If it's 70 for a high, it may take four or five days for it to hatch. But just know that the moth lays eggs on that silk, okay? And your challenge as a grower is to get product on that silk so that the earworm egg comes, or the yeah, earworm larvae comes in contact with that treated silk before it enters the husk. Because once it gets to the husk, you cannot treat it, you cannot manage for it, okay? Pyrethroids are commonly used. Just recall though, just remember, just know that pyrethroid resistance is not, un, it's happened before. So we're seeing, because these earworms, which is a tomato fruit worm in southern United States, is so common down there, many growers have treated for it with pyrethroids. Some of those populations in the southern U.S. have become resistant to pyrethroids. As they fly into the Midwest, we don't know where the populations are coming from, so we have no idea if they're going to be resistant or not. So just take caution if you're using pyrethroids, which every grower does. At some point in time, you may find out that you have a resistant population. You need to take, you need to use alternative sprays, and we'll talk about that here a little bit in a little bit. Uh, but one spray is not going to work the entire season. Uh, very rarely will one or two sprays work because earworm moths are continually flying through the area. And again, your trap will help you determine how often you need to spray. Know, know though that the first sweet corn to silk is going to be especially vulnerable because the first sweet corn to silk is going to start silking in June, at least in our area it is probably the second week of June. And because no field corn is soaking at the same time, every earworm moth is going to be looking for your sweet corn because it's the, the moths know that if they lay eggs on something else, the eggs don't have a very good chance of survival. They know that if they can lay them on the silk of a, of a corn plant, regardless of it's popcorn or field corn or sweet corn, their larvae have a much higher chance of surviving so they're going to be seeking out any green silks to lay eggs on there are no other green silks in illinois the middle of june than sweet corn that's why the first plant of sweet corn is especially vulnerable if you're organic there are some products to use uh, and trust might be one of those uh, if if your market doesn't care, cut off the ends of the ears. I mean, we've done this in the past. When we've been out, when we've been forked out of the field and couldn't spray for earworm for four or five days. It rained every day. We had probably 25% earworm in this one planting of corn. We had to hire extra people to open the ends up of every ear to see if there was a worm in it or not. If it was, we chopped it off and put it into the into our sales pile. If if, if not, it went to the sales pile. But every ear had to be examined. It's possible to do that. It's not uncommon to have to do that. Again, make sure you concentrate your spray on the silks. And as the silks grow, if you made a spray today, let's say, and it's 90 degree day, and I had 50 to 100 moths in my earworm trap, I know I'm going to have to be concerned about putting another application of a pyrethroid on that sweet corn because we had a high earworm count. And because at 90 degree day, 90 degree day, 90 degrees during that day, the silk is growing extremely fast. So I, with the silk I treated today will be two inches down from the husk on Saturday, two days from today. I've got two inches of untreated silk showing. If an earworm moth comes in there, lays an egg on an untreated silk, he's got a free free ride to the husk. So I've got to make sure that any untreated silk is sprayed so I can control the earworm before it gets to the husk. There is genetically modified sweet corn available. It just became available the last couple of years. There's three of them. There's Attribute, Attribute 2, which came out two years ago, and Performance. Okay, Attribute and Attribute 2 are Syngenta. So they use the Syngenta 
uh, pro VT proteins. The original attribute, only 75% of the kernels carried that. The new attribute, uh, over 90% of the kernels carry that trait. So if an earworm, and the thing is with this non-GMO, or with this GMO corn, one of the ideals, ideas is why you want to grow it is to reduce your application of insecticides. If you're not using an insecticide in, in, in earworm, lays an egg, okay, on the, uh, on the silk, that larvae has to get to the ear to start eating that that uh, protein, that Bt protein. If that larvae chooses the wrong kernel with attribute or performance, only 75% of the kernels carry that protein. So only 75% of the kernels carry that Bt trait. If that earworm picks one of the other 25% of the kernels that's not Bt, it's going to survive until it finds a kernel that has one of the BT proteins in it. So it could be a quarter to half inch in length before it finds another another kernel. So we're not 100% effective on controlling earworm by playing a BT hybrid. Now the attribute two, uh, over 90% of the kernels contain that BT protein. So it's much more likely that the larvae will not survive once it takes its first bite. So it, it's an excellent product for controlling earworm, attribute two is, much more so than attribute one or performance. Uh, it does, the, all three of them work on other insects as well, but again, they will not provide 100% control because not 100% of the kernels act, contain that active protein. So why would you use it? Because it costs, it, it's, it's, it, it'll cost you $250 an acre or more in seed to get one of these BT hybrids. So why do people use it? Well, one is because, you know, they don't have the time to spray, for instance, for, for earworm. Maybe they have a, a weed pressure that they can't control otherwise, so they're looking at using Roundup or Liberty to help control that weed. Uh, maybe they want to use less insecticide. Those are some of the things that producers consider to grow a, a, a BT hybrid. But there are a small percent of all the sweet corn grown that's available to growers is actually BT. You know, 85% of it is not BT. There's only a few hybrids that does have the BT strain. There are other pests, of course, besides worms. Uh, raccoons are a common pest we have to deal with. Uh, we'll talk about control of those. Deer, another concern, although not quite as severe as raccoons. And then lastly, the, the picture on the right shows bird damage to sweet corn. Uh, this is a fairly rare occurrence. I've seen it happen to our own corn once in 20 years. This picture here is from a friend of mine in Iowa who had problems with birds in uh, 2013, um, getting to the corn. I have some slides on raccoons and deer, but I don't have anything for birds. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say about birds is trying to keep that husk tip tight. You know, selecting a hybrid that has a height husk tip or a tight husk tip, trying to keep sweet corn away from tree lines because those birds will roost in tree lines and fly down to the field to get into the corn. Uh, that's a possibility. Other control, I call it a balloon man. I'm not sure the proper term. It's uh, You see those uh, those things in front of you, those big, big old, uh, what am I trying to say? Big old balloon man <laughs> in front of used car dealers. You know, they got the fans that go into them to pump them up and they're wiggling and waggling going all over. They're, you know, probably 20, 25 foot tall and they got two arms that flap all over the place. Those do a really good job of keeping birds away. You have to move them every couple days, otherwise the birds become used to it. But they do an excellent job of, of keeping birds away as long as you're close to an electrical outlet. For raccoons, um, for many, many years, we used a two-wire uh, raccoon fence, but uh, oh, probably four, five, six years ago, I think the, the coons watched the Summer Olympics or something because they started hopping two wires, and we got to go three wires now. Um, we just put, we drive T-posts in the corners, and then we use these those little, little yellow fence posts um, uh, as line wires, and we use three insulators. First one will be four inches above the ground. I just put my fingertip to the ground and where my knuckles, my last knuckles are at, that's where I'll put the first wire, about four inches above the ground. 
I'll go five inches above that for the second wire and six inches above that for the third wire. And we do not have raccoon problems anymore at all. You do have to have a excellent ground for this to work. And we're, when we talk about an excellent ground, that means you use a copper ground wire, eight foot in length, driven seven and a half foot into the ground in wet soil. Okay, and that's what you hook your charger up to. All three lines on the wire are hot, but you've got to have a good ground for that thing to work. Just remember that. For deer fencing, you know, uh, we don't have nearly as many problems with deer. We've had them once or twice, but it's not too much of a problem. Uh, upper left-hand corner, if we do, it shows that same three-wire fence again. If we do have problems with deer, what we'll do is we'll string a, a wire on the very top of that yellow post. Then every 40 or 50 foot, I'll, I'll, I'll put a piece of tin foil, I'll dangle a piece of tin foil off that uh, electric fence. And I'll put a finger, finger full of peanut butter on that, on that uh, t piece of tin foil. Deer are naturally inquisitive. Uh, when they smell that peanut butter, they'll come up to it with their nose and try to smell it, to try to figure out what it is. They're going to receive a pretty good shock on the most tender part of their body. And that usually, that's all we need to keep deer away for the most part. If you have a more severe problem, uh, there's two other methods to look at. Upper right-hand corner, uh, I apologize for my uh, artistic skills there, but that is a deer in case anybody was interested. But I'm showing a deer walking up to a fence. That fence is going to be five or six foot in height and protruding from that outward at a 90 degree angle is a three foot extension. And, and you can either put a, a barbed or excuse me, a woven wire or electric wire on the vertical portion and just put a couple uh, wires uh, on the horizontal portion. What happens is that deer, as you can see, walks up to that fence, looks ahead of him, he sees wires, looks on top of him, he sees wires. And he does not try to jump that fence. Even though it's only six foot in height, a deer will not jump a fence that's 3D like this. Okay. If anything, he'll try to go underneath it. So you always want to make sure on a deer fence, your lowest wire is no more than 10 inches above the ground because they'd much rather crawl under than hop over it. But they won't do neither on this fence here because your bottom wire is 10 inches and you've got that three foot extension going outside. So they'll, they'll never jump that fence. A cheaper type of fence like that is in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, this is a 10-foot T-bar driven into the ground at about a 45-degree angle. I got a six-foot post that's, that's vertical to tie into that to keep that T-post from falling over. The bottom three wires are hot. And again, that bottom wire is no more than 10 inches above the ground. Same principle. The deer walks up to that fence, sees wires above him, sees wires in front of him. He's not going to jump it because he doesn't think he can jump that fence. And he's not going to go underneath it because it's 10 foot in height. The uh, bottom right hand corner shows how, what severe deer injury can look like. You know, they're simply going to take a bite out of the top of the corn or eat, actually bite off the tips of the corn themselves. But if you bite off the half, top half of that corn plant, there's no leaves left to photosynthesize that corn plant and you've lost that planting. Or if they take that ear and take, take a bite out of the tip, that's, that's, that ear is not for sale either. So deer can be a problem, but not nearly the problem that, that raccoons can be. But we can solve both problems with, uh, with management. Harvest, um, I always pick at the coolest time of the day. And that's first thing in the morning when the, when the sun rises. Field heat can be high in sweet corn if you wait till pick it in 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of July, right? So you always want to pick corn with it at its coolest because it has a very high respiration rate. You know, it's respiring. Even in, in you know, if it's 65 degrees at night and you're out there at 6.30 in the morning picking, that corn's going to be 65 degrees, it's still going to respire or give off. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start converting those starches to sugar. It was 90 degree day. In the middle of the afternoon, you wait till then to pick. It's just going to respire quicker. You're not going to keep it nearly as long. So always pick early in the day if you can. Store it. If you're going to store it, store it from at temperatures between 32 and 34 degrees, just right above freezing. Um, that's that's our recommendation. Ideal temperatures. 
shrunken so you can keep them for two weeks maybe three weeks at that temperature the se's maybe seven days the su's uh, pick it and don't even put it in a box take it straight to the refrigerator as soon as you pick it because they, they they will convert quickly and we'd always recommend a cover crop after harvest if you're going to harvest you know june or july or excuse me july or august you're going to have that ground available to grow something on for two three maybe four months depending upon where you're at in illinois and how quickly you're harvesting don't leave that ground bare plant something into it uh, plant you know you're talking acres or uh, a lot more space with sweet corn than there are many other vegetables so you may not be growing another vegetable to sell out of that field in that in that uh, location so consider a cover crop especially if you're going to be growing another nitrogen using crop the following year and you have that space available before mid-august it's an excellent place to grow hairy vetch for instance or uh, crimson clover to serve as the nitrogen source for your next crop so you're going to plant tomatoes there next year why not put hairy vetch out there in the middle of august or put crimson clover out there in the middle of august that can be your nitrogen source for your following year's tomato crop or cucumber crop or pumpkin crop whatever put something out there and keep it growing okay that was my last slide i just want to put a plug in for future sessions on the webinar and, and they are as follows so how we doing, Kyle? We got questions need to answer? Or? A couple of them that I took care of. Mike was talking about, you know, strategies for maybe getting that last, last uh, planting in for later in the fall. Cool temperatures, kind of, we have to fight those a little bit. If you have any more thoughts on anything we can do there, I tried to answer it, but any thoughts on that very last planting you do? What about the last planting? Well, just you know. You're gonna if you want to sell some, you know, first October or something like that. You're starting to lose growing degree days. It's just harder to, you know, get enough time in to get that last crop in. So I just mentioned, you know, variety selection and paying attention to your growing degree days and how much you need to get that crop, you know, to maturity. Yeah, just know that, you know, as we go past June 21st, we're getting less sunlight, and as we if we're planting in August to get an October to get an October crop. You know, it's, it's not going to mature nearly as fast as planting in, in May and getting July crops. So, yeah, you're going to see a little bit lengthier time for maturity, Kyle. You're right. Uh, you covered the um, the cover crops and that. Well, good luck growing sweet corn, guys, uh, and gals, for that matter. It's a great crop to grow. It's an easy crop to grow. Uh, it's, it's a crop that you know there's a lot of demand uh, okay can you grow sweet corn in the hoop house just a few for personal use yeah you can uh, I, I don't know why you'd want to uh, I guess if you want to get a jump on harvest you can if you're gonna be planting them in a hoop house plant them on the north extreme north side of your hoop house because they're gonna get fairly good size and you don't want that shade shading out any other crops you're growing in that hoop house. Okay, so yeah, you can grow sweet corn in a hoop house. Shouldn't be a problem at all. I've been told to put the deer fence up a month before you plant your crop. Is that the first one to mention, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, deer fence. Yeah, deer are ha creatures of habit. You know, they're going to kind of walk the same area day and not every day, but they're very much creatures of habit. And they're grazers. You know, they won't, they'll, they'll, as they graze, they're going to be walking, or as they're walking, they're going to be grazing. They don't sit around very long in, in, in a smorgasbord like we do. They, I guess that's why you don't see too many fat deer. They're eating while they're walking, right? Uh, yeah, so if you can put your deer fence up earlier, the better off you are to get those deer adjusted to it. Just make sure it works when you put it up. Don't put it up and not hook it, not hook it up to the electric fence. Hook it up as soon as you get it. Uh, matter of fact, we grow strawberries, and strawberries are notorious for having deer problems. We have elect we put an electric fence up on that strawberry patch, um, first part of October. We still have it on today. That fence is still on because deer are creatures of habit, and I don't want them to touch that fence and not get shocked. So we put it on as soon as we can. We leave it on. A few dollars in electricity is nothing compared with the crops going to bring you. So put it up on, put it early, like you said and uh, you'll be probably better off. Can using black pla black fabric between rows be useful to help fight weeds? Well, you bet it can. Uh, 
don't know how big your sweet corn patch is going to be, but you got to be able to plant the sweet corn too. And, and most sweet corn is planted in 30 inch rows. Uh, I guess you go 36 or 38 inch rows or 40 inch rows for that matter. So you can put, you know, black plastic between the rows, but you got to anchor that pla back black plastic somehow to keep it from floating off of there. And usually it means you have to bury the sides of it. Um, but yeah, you can certainly use black plastic. I, I think you might be better off utilizing something like newspaper, for instance, putting newspaper between your row. And then after, after you plant your corn, plant your corn, if it gets up an inch or so, you know where it's at, get newspaper, put it between your rows, and then cover that newspaper with either grass clippings or straw. That way the newspaper does not blow off. And it's all, it all can be incorporated at the end of the year. Okay. But you've kept sunlight from reaching the soil surface by a newspaper with several inches of mulch on it. That's a fantastic weed control. Uh, and you can incorporate it into the season so it's not going to cause any extra problems. How do you plant in black plastic? Uh, there's transplanters that will transplant through plastic. Or you can just poke a hole with your finger. And you know, you're not going to do this with a machine unless you buy the equipment for it. And the equipment is somewhat expensive. Unless your commercial grower has a number of acres and it's got a contract for sweet corn, it's probably not going to be worth your while. But if you just want some for home use, you know, put a raised bed in, make sure you got good uh, contact between the black plastic and the soil so that all the heat that's generated by that black plastic will transfer into the soil. And then uh, just poke a hole in it and plant it. Uh, Best organic cultivars for Illinois. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there are several companies that sell organic corn. Uh, Johnny's being one of them. The thing is, you're not going to, and I shouldn't. What I've seen for organic corn are not the hybrids that are that the majority of commercial guys are growing. You may find them, but you probably have some difficulty finding more elite hybrids. I did just read um, that the University of Wisconsin developed an open pollinated organic corn specifically for organic growers. It's a bicolor corn. I can't remember the name of it, but just do a Google search for University of Wisconsin organic corn hybrid. It just came out with it this year. They've worked with a couple of organic growers in Wisconsin. And the, or the corn breeder at the University of Wisconsin over the last four or five years to develop this hybrid. So I don't recall the name of it, but uh, I'm sure it's on. Do a, Google search, Google, do a Google search and you could find it. What about block planting versus row planting for small plantings for pollination? Yeah. Again, you want a minimum of two rows wide so you get good pollination occurring. Uh, more than that would be better, but a minimum of two rows wide. David, is there a recommendation for insecticide spraying methods in terms of overhead broadcast spraying or drop down nozzle with a self propelled sprayer? Uh, yeah, what we do on our on our corn, we plant 12 row blocks. Okay, we got 12 rows and we have about a 10 foot gap. In that 10 foot gap, we take a tractor and a sprayer. Well, we had a tractor and a sprayer, we use a high boy now. We took a tractor and a sprayer. And I mounted the booms up on that sprayer about eight foot tall. Okay, I just built a built a a bar so I could raise them up to ten foot tall or eight foot tall. Took an extension on the side of that boom and went out so I could cover six rows. Okay, on that extension I took my insecticide hose and I put drop nozzles down so I can spray thirty inches below that drop bar. So I'm concentrating that spray on the silk. That's what you want to do. You want to spray the silk. It doesn't do any good to spray the whole field. You want to spray the silk. So until we had this high boy, I just took a tractor and a sprayer, mounted the boom up to eight foot, built a bar over so I go over six rows of corn, put a drop nozzle at the bottom of that. At the bottom of that drop nozzle, I got two nozzles going out at 180 degrees, one going to one row, one going to the other row. So I'm covering both rows with two nozzles, so I'm spraying, I'm, I'm spraying in to the row from two sides to get excellent coverage on the silks. Okay. And Mike, we just might want to mention on that new 
a variety from Wisconsin. If if people, I don't even know if you can get it yet this year. Maybe you can, but if you decide to use that, you're going to have to really think through the uh, cross pollination where that's planted and what have you, right? It'd be no different than anything else. Yeah. And with this open pollinated seed, my guess is you could keep the seed yourself too, mm -hmm. and and keep it true to type. Is there a certain height where the sweet corn plant will do a good job blocking out sunlight getting to weeds? The more dense your stand, the closer your row spacing is, the more sunlight you're going to keep from striking the ground, the better your weed control is going to be. That's how competition works, by preventing sunlight from striking the soil surface, because weeds need sunlight to germinate. Okay, so if you can keep sunlight from striking the earth, you're going to be much better off as far as a competitive crop. Are there any SA2 organic sweet corn varieties? I do not know that. Um, we do not grow organic corn, so I haven't really looked at purchasing organic corn or what varieties there are. I would suggest that um, Johnny's, for instance, might have organic corn. I don't know. They care a lot about other organic products. There may be others out there. I'm just not aware of them. I think a Google search might be in order for that question, though. Just ask your supplier wherever you're getting stuff from now, and they'll tell you what they've got. Can you address the equipment for planting through plastic? That's a specialized equipment. Um, again, a Google search will show you what those are, but that's not going to be a, a cheap piece of equipment. Um, and, and a lot of them, what I've seen for Wisconsin growers especially, there, and they have this is all one setup. The tractor pulls this through the field. There'll be a planter, and then there'll be a, a how else to say this, but a mechanism on the back of that planter that sets up a small, uh, low a low tunnel over the. And what they'll do, let me back up. This planter will plant two two rows, maybe 15 inches wide or something like that. So they're narrowing their rows together. Okay, they plant two rows 15 inches apart. Right behind that, there's a device on that planter that will put up a low tunnel, a clear low tunnel, right? It'll install some, uh, uh, some, some will install a hoop, a wire hoop. Some just lay the plastic flat on the ground, okay? So it depends on which of those two you get, either the hoop version, which will raise that plastic up maybe 10, 12 inches above the ground, or if it doesn't install a hoop, it'll just lay the plastic flat on the ground. Either way, that clear plastic accumulates sunlight that sunlight gets down into into the protected area, the two rows of sweet corn are planted onto, warms that ground up rather quickly. If they're putting the hoops or the, the hoops up, they're probably going to have slitted plastic to allow some of that excess heat to escape because you can imagine what's going to happen on a 65 degree day, the sun's out, how hot it's going to be in there. So they got to have a way to get that excess of heat out of there. So they're probably using slitted clear plastic in that case. And that clear plastic does not remain for the entire growing season. They're going to take it off. Well, once the corn gets established and temperatures get warm, they're going to take it off of there so it doesn't inhibit the growth of that corn plant. It's a specific piece of equipment that these commercial guys are using. And Mike, aren't there a few people that are kind of experimenting with uh, transplanting uh, and using water wheel planters on a small scale? Yeah, we, we, yeah there are transplants being used. Um, I don't know if they're using a water wheel for it. I guess you could. I don't know that you could drive slow enough to plant with a water wheel, though. Right, right. Um, the, the transplanters I've seen and heard about are specifically for planting, sometimes through plastic, sometimes planting on bare ground. But they're specific for a narrow... Because you're, you're, you're talking 8 or 10 inches between seeds or transplants with sweet corn. Right. And it's going to be hard to do that with a water wheel and... and Either move your hands fast enough if you're planted or drive slow enough if you're, the, if you're on the tractor. Very good. Well, thanks, guys. And just remember the upcoming programs we have here for you. And uh, hope you uh, – I wish you well in your growing season. Thanks for attending, everybody. See you next week, hopefully. Thanks, Mike.